In this video we're going to start looking at the head and neck region. First off we're going to have a look at the subdivisions of the head and neck, specifically here in this case the triangles. For descriptive purposes to make it easy to communicate about this region, the neck has been divided into triangles, a posterior triangle and an anterior triangle, which in itself has been subdivided again to four smaller triangles. So let's start off with the posterior triangle because this is quite straightforward. The anterior border of this triangle is going to be the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The posterior border is going to be the superior border of the trapezius muscle. The inferior border is going to be the middle one-third of the clavicle that we can see here. The superficial border is going to be the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia, which would just get in the way here, that's why I've taken it away. It's also described as the roof of this triangle. And the deep border would be the floor. So the muscles of the neck that are covered, again, here in prevertebral fascia, which I'm not displaying because it would just get in the way. You can see here now that we have some of the cutaneous nerves for the shoulder and the anterior neck that are going to be passing to the surface through the posterior triangle of the neck. Therefore, these structures are going to be dissected with the posterior triangle as we did in lab. Remember to identify the platysma muscle. Yeah, it's very thin, and in most cases you will have already cut that away from the attachment on the mandible and from its attachment here along the clavicle and the sternum. Some of the nerves that were coming out here in close proximity to the sternocleidomastoid would be your great auricular nerve, then coming out back here is the lesser occipital nerve, transverse cervical nerves, and supraclavicular nerves. Don't forget that you will also have here the accessory nerve, cranial nerve number 11. To make that visible, I've had to actually ghost the SCM in this region. We can see it comes out from slightly posterior to the midpoint of the posterior border of the SCM up here and goes over to the superior border of the trapezius muscle right there. Let me just add in veins here that we can have a look at one important vein for us, which is the external jugular vein, the EJV, not to be confused with the IJV. I'll go ahead and hide the platysma. And here we can see that the EJV is superficial to the sternocleidomastoid, so it crosses its border superficially here, and it begins posterior to the angle of the mandible. So if we now put everything together for the big picture, we can see that the external jugular vein will originate by the union of the retromandibular and posterior auricular veins. It will course superficial to the now ghosted sternocleidomastoid on its way down to then drain into the subclavian vein, respectively, right? down here. Moving on. Now let's have a look at the anterior cervical region or the anterior triangle of the neck. The anterior triangle has the following features. The anterior boundary is going to be the midline of the neck. The posterior boundary is going to be formed by the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The superior boundary will be formed by the inferior border of the mandible. The apex is located down here at the jugular notch of the manubrium. It has a roof which is formed by the subcutaneous tissue which contains the platysma. It's been removed in this picture. And the floor will be formed by the pharynx, the larynx, and the thyroid gland also removed in this picture. Now let's have a look at some of the subdivisions of the anterior triangle of the neck. We have first here the submental triangle, which is an unpaired triangle bounded by the anterior bellies, the digastric and the hyoid bone. Then we have the submandibular triangle. The submandibular triangle is bounded by the inferior border of the mandible and the anterior and posterior bellies of the digastric. Next we have the carotid triangle, which is bounded by the posterior belly of the digastric, the sternocleidomastoid, and the superior belly of the omohyoid. And then last but not least, we have the muscular triangle, which is bounded by the midline of the neck, the sternocleidomastoid, and the superior belly of the omohyoid. Okay, now we're going to have a look at these triangles in a little more detail, starting off with the submandibular triangle, which is a glandular area between the inferior border of the mandible and the anterior and posterior bellies of the digastric muscles. To do this, let's have a look and tilt our virtual dissection like so. And here we can now see 
Here's the anterior belly of the digastric. Remember, this is innervated by a branch of V3, which is called the mylohyoid nerve or nerve to mylohyoid. Here's the posterior belly of the digastric because these two bellies of these muscles come from different arches in embryology. This is actually innervated by the facial nerve. And the last border is going to be the inferior border of the mandible. If we get even a little bit closer like this, you can see that the floor is going to be formed in part by this muscle, which is the mylohyoid muscle. Also contributing to the floor is going to be the hyoglossus muscle and the middle pharyngeal constrictor. What do we find in this triangle? Well, we see the facial artery crossing over the mandible here. Parallel to that would be the facial vein. Let me remove the veins again. The stylohyoid muscle is also in here. As you can see, the stylohyoid will be straddling the posterior belly of the digastric. And as the name implies, it actually comes from the styloid process back here and goes all the way to the hyoid. You can imagine that it will be helping to elevate the hyoid bone. You also find in this triangle the submandibular gland, which for practicality reasons, I'm just going to go ahead and hide again. You will find some submandibular lymph nodes, and you also find part of your hypoglossal nerve. Remember that the hypoglossal nerve comes deep down from back here, posterior to the posterior belly of the digastric and loops around and then goes deep down into the mylohyoid muscle. Okay, so now let's look at the next triangle, which is probably the simplest of all of the triangles that we have. It's called the submental triangle. This is gonna be inferior to the chin, as you can see right here. And it's really pretty straightforward because it's just a really small suprahyoid area, which is gonna be bounded inferiorly by the body of the hyoid right here, and laterally just by the right and left anterior bellies of the digastric muscles. The floor is made up by the mylohyoid muscle. And the apex of the triangle would be the symphysis of the mandible. There's not really very much going on in the triangle. You might find some little submandibular lymph nodes here, and ultimately some veins that will help contribute to the formation of the anterior jugular vein. Next in line is the carotid triangle. The carotid triangle is a vascular area that is bounded by the following structures. The superior belly of the omohyoid, the posterior belly of the digastric, and the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. This area is important because the common carotid artery ascends into it. I've highlighted the artery for us right now. And you can even auscultate or palpate the pulse by compressing it lightly against the transverse process of the cervical vertebrae. The neurovascular structures within the carotid triangle are surrounded by a structure called the carotid sheath. The most important structures I would say within the carotid triangle would be in that case, the common carotid artery. Let me add in the veins. And we have the internal jugular vein that travels with the common carotid artery. And then in terms of nerves, also traveling within the sheath, would be the vagus nerve. You can see that now with all of the neurovasculature highlighted, everything is getting pretty busy though. One more thing you should remember is that we have also the so-called ansa cervicalis that would actually be lying on or being embedded in the anterolateral aspect of the carotid sheath. If I put this all together like this, we can see here is our hypoglossal nerve and coming off it here, just hitching a ride on basically are the fibers that are contributing to the superior root of the ansa cervicalis, and then go around, loop around here to the inferior root. As we were just looking at some of the vasculature in the carotid region, let's recall our funny mnemonic here, SALFOPSUM, which stands for the most important branches of the external carotid artery. So, and then ascending manner would be superior thyroid, ascending pharyngeal, lingual, facial, occipital, posterior, auricular, superficial, temporal, and maxillary. If we add these in one by one for us now, here's the superior thyroid, ascending pharyngeal, lingual, facial, occipital, posterior, auricular, maxillary, superficial, temporal. Now let's have a look at these in 3D, and I'm gonna highlight these in sequence. Here's the common carotid, here's the external carotid, superior thyroid, ascending pharyngeal, lingual, facial,
occipital. Posterior auricular, superficial temporal, and maxillary. Next in line for us is the muscular triangle. The muscular triangle is bounded by the superior belly of the omohyoid muscle, the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, and the median plane of the neck. Within this triangle, we're going to find the infrahyoid muscles, in addition to the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland. Our infrahyoid group of muscles are arranged in two planes, a superficial plane, which is going to be made up of the sternohyoid and the omohyoid, sternohyoid, omohyoid on the left, sternohyoid, omohyoid on the right, and a deep plane composed of two muscles named the sternothyroid and thyrohyoid. To visualize these, let me hide these muscles first. So here in the deep plane, here's the sternothyroid, and then, as the name implies, the thyrohyoid. If we also remove these muscles now, we can see the thyroid gland lying beneath it. This thyroid gland specifically is actually quite interesting because it has one of these little extra lobes here, which is called a pyramidal lobe. Before we move on to the hyoid muscle, let's point out this little muscle here, this is the cricothyroid muscle. Yeah? The cricothyroid muscle is actually interesting because it is actually an intrinsic muscle of the larynx, but it's not supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. This muscle is actually supplied by the external laryngeal nerve, which is one of the two terminal branches of the superior laryngeal nerve. So now let's have a look at the suprahyoid muscles. Amongst these muscles are the following ones the digastrix, anterior and posterior bellies, the stylohyoid muscles, and remember, the stylohyoid kind of straddles the posterior belly of the digastric on its way down. Here's the intermediate tendon between the digastrix, and also don't forget that the digastric bellies have different innervations. This one, anterior belly, via V3, the nerve to the mylohyoid does this, and the posterior belly is innervated via the facial nerve. Another muscle in this group is going to be the mylohyoid muscle. And if I hide these, we can see the last muscle of this group, which is going to be the geniohyoid, located right here. Now let's have a look at some cadaveric images also brought to us by Primal 3D Atlas of Human Anatomy. We're now looking at the left side of the neck from the left and front. Here is the accessory nerve. Here are the spinal roots of the accessory nerve. Here's the anterior belly of the digastric. There are anterior jugular veins. The upper trunks of the brachial plexus are visible here. Here's the common carotid artery. Here's the external carotid artery. Here's the superior thyroid artery. Here's the superior laryngeal artery. Here's the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Here's the facial artery. Here's the posterior belly of the digastric. Here's the submandibular gland and the anterior belly of the digastric. Here's the location of the hyoid bone. Here's the superior belly, the omohyoid. Here's the sternohyoid. Here's the left lobe of the thyroid gland. Here's the SCM, and this is the clavicular head of the SCM. Here's the anterior scalene muscle. Here's the middle scalene muscle, and you can see that the phrenic nerve is going to be crossing anterior to the anterior scalene, and coming out in between the anterior and middle scalene are going to be the upper trunks of the brachial plexus. Here's the facial vein. Here's the retromandibular vein. 
Here's the posteroricular vein. The retromandibular and posteroricular vein merge to form the external jugular vein, crossing over the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. Here's a deep dissection of the neck. Here again is the omohyoid, superior belly. Here's the little sling. Then here's the inferior belly, the omohyoid. Here's the sternohyoid. And here's the sternothyroid. Here's the thyrohyoid. Here's the common carotid artery. Here's the superior thyroid artery. Here's the superior laryngeal artery. Here is the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Here's the continuation of the external carotid artery. Here's the lingual artery. Here's the hypoglossal nerve. Here's the facial artery. And here's the continuation of the external carotid. Here's the IJV. And here is the ansa cervicalis. Here is the inferior root. And here it loops around. And here's the superior root. This supplies the motor innervation to your infrahyoid muscles. Here's your anterior scalene muscle with the characteristic phrenic nerve crossing anterior to it. And here's the upper trunk of the brachial plexus coming out in between the anterior and the middle scalene muscle. Thank <laughs> you.